good to be with you. My topic is uh, love your enemies, kill your friends, hate your life. When I told my research assistant about this topic, she said, that can't possibly be the title. <laughs> and so she sort of changed it to forgive those who offend you rather than loving your enemy. And she said, this business about killing your friends, nobody's going to buy that. So why not facing tragedy or adversity? And then hating your life, not so good. Uh, why not? Giving it would be better. Now, I appreciated her gesture, but I'm going to stick with love, your enemies, because my talk today is really about politics, about getting along, about a society that, in fact, just seems to be going out of its way not to love, not to open itself out to competing ideas, but instead to find ways to divide up into camps so that we don't talk to each other, so that we don't try and see the other person's perspective, but instead we just take sides and constantly shout. And we have this heated conversation that goes nowhere. It was so great to see Jared's earlier presentation because the individualized notion of communications just holds so much promise because ours is a bottom-up society. And if we get this right in our own lives, if we find ways to love our enemies, to look past our differences in our personal lives, in our families, in our businesses, in our churches, and in our politics, it will come to pass as well. The most exceptional times are, are when we, in fact, have expressed love uh, through particular political figures. I, had, I cut my teeth in politics with my dad, who was a born Democrat, who loved the Kennedys, who was finding every vote in a Chicago cemetery that he could cast for them. And John Kennedy, of course, had so much to say to us about our present day experience. But I just want to give you one line. He told us, remember a society that is not capable of taking care of the many who are poor cannot possibly save the few who are rich. You know, I constantly ask my students in class, what are those people doing occupying those places, those town centers and those town squares? And I get some blank looks. But John Kennedy had answered that question right there in that single sentence. Robert Kennedy, of course, carried on his brother's tradition. Part of it, part of it was the tradition of recognizing that there had to be fairness, there had to be civil rights, there had to be human rights acknowledged, and those had to be acknowledged in a nonviolent way. And how wonderful it was that how wonderful it was that he carried on that tradition in a way that addressed the suffering, tried to stop the war, tried to right the wrongs, and how tragic it was to lose him. Tragedy seemed to befit that family. And now you say, well, what is, he, what is he putting up Reagan for at this point? How different that person is. But the illustration is love and loving your enemies and achieving is not a partisan thing. Because if you think about the greatness of his presidency, it was those times when he wanted to lift us up, when he reminded us that the people who came here wanted to be that shining city on the hill. And how were they going to be that shining city on the hill? Not by not caring for each other, but by recognizing that they were interdependent. That language, that shining city on the hill, comes from a sermon in the 1600s where on the deck of the Arabella, they're saying, when we get off this ship, we have to remember we're not alone. We have to form a community. And he was at his best when he stood at that wall and he, you know those famous words, take this wall down. And he said it with defiance, but it was a defiance of love. It was a love that said, unite these two parts of Berlin, unite this Germany, reunite these families, let the, let the potential be lifted up. And of course, we had most recently the 2008 campaign, a campaign in which Barack Obama very thoughtfully told us that we're not red states, we're not blue states, we're the United States. We're the place where we have to find common ground, not 
a basis upon which to hate each other, a common enemy. You know, our foreign policy, too, has been the best when we have not bought into this notion that the enemy of our enemy is our friend. Because think about what that leads to. We ended up falling into league with Joseph Stalin because we thought he opposed Hitler. And he ended up being, in many ways, a worse Hitler than Hitler. We ended up falling into league with Saddam Hussein because he opposed the Soviet Union. And Saddam Hussein, of course, murdered his own people. And then we fell into league with the very timely guy, Muammar Gaddafi, because he told us he was against Al-Qaeda. What kind of foreign policy is it that's constructed on the hatred of others? It's a foreign policy that doesn't last. And one of the gifts of our current president is that he's taken us to a place where the people in Europe recognize that he's at once trying to make our principles based upon the common ground for the common good. You know, these, this has been my life in the last two years, trying to discover the many opportunities that there are to find that common ground. But there's the other part of the story, and it's the part of the story that I had originally phrased as kill your friends. Killing your friends is not a good idea. Unfortunately, it's something that happened to me on a canyon road. And it happened in four seconds time. Count those four seconds, if you would, with me. One, two, two three, three, four. four. That's all it took for one little tire of a Hyundai to leave the highway and hit a drainage ditch. And then, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there was no no beauty in the world. There was just darkness. There was this incomplete trip. And there was this wonderful, these wonderful sources of kindness that we all know from our own community. Next to me, Monsignor John Sheridan, Sister Mary Campbell, the three of us celebrating the fact that we were together for the first time, having been apart for, for a year. And within an hour or two of this photograph, Mary would be gone. And within three weeks, John would be gone. And I would be seriously injured myself. But the physical injuries were at the half of it. The physical injuries paled in comparison to the why question. Why is this suffering here? Why is it happening? And of course, John wouldn't have had that question. John would have basically said, you have to accept what it is have to accept what comes your way, and then you have to lift yourself up. There's this wonderful line in the liturgy that says, lift up your hearts. And whenever John said that, he meant it. He meant it in a way that go out there and not find what is wrong in the world. Find what can be preserved. Accept people as they are. Their kindness and their greatness will outshine. And in that he said, yes, hate your life. But hate it in this sense. Hate it in the sense that you don't want to, a life just dedicated to money or power or lust or pleasures, but you want a life that is given. You are given a great gift of life, and so you too can be given the opportunity to give it away, to find yourself by being of service to others. And once again, we come back to our national politics and our individual lives. By loving our enemies, by conquering the challenges, by overcoming the hate and the division, we are giving our lives. The best example of that that I can think of is the wonderful Mother Teresa, but also John Sheridan and Mary Campbell. And let me just leave you with something, since we're close to Hollywood, of a story that you know well but maybe you haven't thought about it in a while. The one about the six-foot rabbit. Do you remember it? Do you remember Harvey? Do you remember Jimmy Stewart? Jimmy Stewart's seeing this wonderful apparition, and he's taking it all around the town. And people are coming to him, and they're saying, let me tell you my dreams. And Jimmy would say, yes, tell me those dreams. And he would affirm them, and he would make them feel as if they could be accomplished, and they would accomplish them. wanted to put him away. 
But Jimmy had the final word, didn't he? The doctor at the end said, you know, how do you put up with this? And he said, long ago, doctor, my mother told me, in this life you can be very, very smart or oh so pleasant. I've tried smart. I recommend pleasant. I recommend it to you too. God bless.